Okay, so thanks everyone for coming to the last ISL colloquium of the quarter. Today we have Chaba here to talk to us about uh, his recent work between tractable and intractable problems in RL. So thank you for coming and please take it away. Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be to be there virtually. Uh, it would be even better to be there physically, but this is uh, how far you can go these days. So that's it. Uh, and uh, so today I wanted to uh, just talk about uh, my thoughts about uh, like how to view uh, RL and, 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 and a more general view of RL, basically. And uh, I'm really looking forward for, for feedback as well. Uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, just please ask either in the chat or maybe you can even jump in. Yeah, we don't have that many people. I think we can do this. Um, and I will try to adapt. Like if you have, we have questions about some parts and we talk about that and like somehow be flexible about this. All right, so what is this about? Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks uh, to all the wonderful colleagues without whom uh, this talk would not have been possible. Um, so a lot of the work was done in collaboration with uh, the student Galliot Weiss, uh, who is uh, at DeepMind and he's a PhD student. And also um, these other students, Russian Sharif, uh, Philippa Mortia and Bonabash Yonser contributed uh, quite a bit. And uh, some more seasoned colleagues, uh, Former students, uh, former former postdoc, I guess, Yasin, Nan, and then Tor. And I also want to thank uh, this uh, other group of people who didn't directly contribute to this talk, but they contributed a lot by giving us inspiration to talk about these issues uh, by writing nice papers. And so there are Simon Shem, Drusong, and Lin. You probably have heard them speaking at this seminar. Um, okay, so what is the topic today? Well, in a nutshell, RL is really cool. Sometimes it works. We have seen many examples uh, and every day newer and newer examples are popping up. I just like noticed that uh, there is a new nature publication by Google people about using reinforcement learning to optimize VLSI layouts. And uh, this has actually been used to design the future generation of TPUs. Uh, and uh, so RL seems to be doing pretty well uh, a lot of times, but if people, when people, you talk to people who work on RL, they're gonna complain, of course, about that. Oh, like, it's not reliable enough. Uh, we may not know exactly when it works and why it works, which algorithm to use. Uh, there is this uh, alphabet soup of algorithms, uh, like more and more algorithms showing up. And um, so I think that it would be nice to have some guiding principles in place of uh, for choosing between the algorithms and like, you know, like sorting through all this. Uh, that is happening, all these exciting developments that have been happening in the field. Um, a lot of times you read these uh, papers that are talking about the specific applications and they will have pretty complicated algorithms with a lot of moving parts and it's kind of difficult to see which of these parts are essential for the success. And how can we make progress on this? Well, a theoretician's answer can only be that, well, we have to do theory, right? So that's my answer. Uh, so what I'm proposing is to, uh, to take a careful look and develop some form of framework uh, to try to understand uh, when can we expect other algorithms as we know them or uh, yet to be discovered algorithms uh, to work well on large scale problems, all right? Uh, so that's, that's the topic. So it's, it's gonna be uh, 
a lot about the framework, discussing why and how, like the different aspects of, of choosing things in a framework. And then a little bit about the results as well that we have, like we're gonna have like uh, the title of the talk is between tractable and intractable. And like, you will see that nuances seem to matter a lot. And, and that's a little bit puzzling to, uh, to me. So I, I'm not sure I kind of understand how to navigate this space yet. And I, I think that like we have a very partial picture of, of what's going on. Anyway, so that, let's get started. Uh, so the framework is, uh, is kind of simple. Like you need three different things uh, to talk about in a meaningful way about when do you like an algorithm? <laughs> so what algorithms do we like? Uh, we like algorithms which are general or flexible. Uh, Reed Sutton likes to uh, say these days that these are only potent algorithms. They, they could be applied to anything. So they have some sort of flexibility, generality. We want this, definitely. We also want algorithms that uh, take the most out of like all of the problems, take all the truths, right? Like they should be effective. If, if you can have effective algorithms, why would not, why would you not have effective algorithms? And you don't want algorithms which are overly lazy in, you know, doing the job. You want effective algorithms. Um, and you also want efficient algorithms. And these are two different things, slightly different things, right? So. Effective algorithm means that you have a task metric and the algorithm is expected to do well on the task metric, right? So if you're solving shortest pass problems and you develop an algorithm, then you expect the algorithm to find a pretty short pass. If it, it fails to find short pass, then it's not really doing its job. So that's what I mean by effective algorithms. And uh, by efficiency, we just usually we just just mean the usual things that, in terms of resource utilization, these these algorithms are are efficient, so that they don't use uh, unnecessarily uh, large amounts of compute resources, basically. And um, so I think that this framework is behind a lot of the work that has been going on in reinforcement learning and also in other fields, like whatever field you are in, if you're in the business of designing algorithms, then, then you keep thinking about these things. So maybe people don't say this really explicitly, but, but it's there. And I put the uh, cover of this uh, wonderful big, uh, book there uh, in the bottom, Beyond the Worst Case Analysis of Algorithms, because this book is sort of taking this viewpoint a little bit, like not quite this, but like it's, it's pretty close, like different ways of approaching this, uh, these questions that, that we are also attacking here. Um, all right, um, so that's, that's the framework in a nutshell, but uh, I wanna fill this framework up with some details uh, in the context of, of reinforcement learning. So um, let's start with uh, some basics. Uh, so the, the framework starts with uh, specifying tasks. And for specifying tasks, I'm going to use the language of Markov decision processes. And I guess everyone uh, on this call will know what Markov decision processes are, uh, what they're about. Uh, basically, you have a controlled state, uh, which you can steer by choosing actions and uh, and you try to steer the state in such a way that you're collecting as much reward as, as you can. And sometimes you have to take uh, momentarily suboptimally looking actions uh, to eventually uh, win the big prices. And uh, all this control is stochastic, uh, that is stochastic trans, uh, state transitions. And, um, for our purposes, what's important to, to remember about Markov decision processes is that the way we typically think about solving Markov decision processes, by solving, I mean that, uh, like, so that's planning, right? Like you're given a specification of such a process, which are like the, all these transition probabilities in the process, given the different actions, different states, and all the rewards, that's, that's the specs. 
and then uh, you want uh, to, to find a policy which is a map from states to actions or, or distributions of actions, or maybe it maps histories to actions. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, you want to find a policy, this, this steering thing uh, that gives you uh, as high cumulated reward over time cumulated reward as, as possible. And the value function of a policy is just captures this idea that, wow, you can assign a value to every state given a policy uh, in an MDP, and you're looking for the policy which maximizes uh, the value either at the fixed star distribution, and that's the viewpoint that I'm going to take a lot of times, so or at all states possibly, and the basic, um, theory of MDPs just says that uh, you can do this if you find what's known as the optimal action value function. This is a Q star function. This gives you the best possible values achievable by any policy if you first start at the state by choosing some action. So it assigns a value to a state action pair. And, uh, and if you knew this function, then you would just like, maximize at every state like uh, this function, this suspected action component, that would give you the action to take, which is guaranteed to be an optimal, uh, which is guaranteed to give you an optimal way of acting as a function of the state. So that's, that's the optimal policy. It will give you an optimal policy. So that's, um, that's what um, is important for us from the, the basic theory of MDPs for today. Because uh, for a large part of the talk, we're gonna talk about these different value functions. Um, so does any, anyone have any questions? Good, I guess no questions. I'm gonna talk mostly about the discounted framework. Maybe sometimes there is some appearance to, uh, of, of the finite horizon framework uh, when you, uh, you run your policy for a fixed number of uh, time steps. So that's the fixed horizon episodic setting, and then you reset to some initial state or initial state distribution. All right, um, so what do we know about tractability of MDPs? Uh, of course, this is all, all classic stuff by now, although here you will see a bunch of the references are quite new, uh, which is quite amazing given uh, how um, early on people proposed uh, this framework of MDPs, but uh, I guess people were not that much into computation, so that's why we have these uh, more recent references. But here we are interested in, in computational complexity of finding a good policy or an optimal policy. And so the first thing uh, is to know that if you are given uh, an MDP as a big table of transition probabilities, then you have to read this full table in order to know how to act well in the MDP up to, uh, I don't know, like additive constant factor uh, approximation, like an additive gap of one uh, for discounting or finite residency, it doesn't matter. Like you have to read the full table so that's the complexity of S squared and A. S is the number of states. A is the number of actions. Okay, so fine. That seems like a really basic stuff. Um, you can improve uh, your situation a little bit and, and reduce the dependency on the number of states if you have access to a simulator. Um, if you have access to a simulator somehow magically, uh, you don't actually have to read the full table. It's some sparsity stuff comes up. Uh, you just have to uh, compute averages and then that allows you to, to shave off roughly a factor of X. Um, so that's, that's great, but still the number of state appears. But it, it happens that if you're not interested in uh, discovering a policy which it can be used at any state whatsoever that, that you are thrown at you, that is thrown at you. But it can only be used at a, a single state. And, uh, you're given a state and you just have to, like you don't need a policy, you just have, have to know what is a good action to take at, at that state. 
such that you, you do your planning, you come up with the action, and then if the system would be moved to the, the resulting state, if you take the action, and, and uh, the model that you, you used was, was the real world, you move to the next state and then you redo this planning. So that's like model predictive control or whatnot. Then the resulting induced performance is good. Okay. So this is what I call local planning. So here you relax the goal. You don't need a globally optimal policy. So you don't have to consider all the state action pairs. So you can just build a look ahead tree, right? And then you can understand the branching factor is going to be age. And if you have some whole need to plan for a horizon of age, then of course the complexity is going to be something like age to the power of age. This is a lower bound. This is essentially an upper bound. Um, you can't do much better than this in a worst case, uh, but you can do this. And, and at least this is independent of the number of states, right? So we see that you don't have to have the number of states, but now we're exponentially in the horizon. So there are two things to worry about uh, from this little preamble. It's the number of states. Uh, you have to be scared if you're thrown uh, at you a problem that has a huge number of states or you have a problem with long horizon. All right, so this just shows that what this local planning is. You have a simulator and real environment and, and the planner itself has access to the same thing and it, it's just replanning uh, in a loop. So control people like to call this MPC, model predictive control. So in a way, local planning is just MPC. All right, so how big are these MDPs uh, that people are demonstrating good results on? So these are the examples uh, from this slide. Well, the horizon tends to be in the range of hundreds or thousands or larger. The number of states is also huge. Like, I'm not going to read these numbers, but uh, just, just a side remark, like, okay, um, some of these problems have continuous uh, state act action spaces and, and the actions, like, I'm not going to even touch it. I guess, like, we go a little bit there. Like, what happens if you have a large number of actions? That seems to be an extra curse. Um, if you have a large number of states, maybe you can do something about that. If you have a large number of actions, the, the challenges are, are really multiplied in a, in a true sense uh, that we will see. All right, so why does uh, ARA succeed? Uh, so I say that uh, based on what we have seen uh, in the literature, the successes, uh, just investigate the successes. It's pretty clear that the following components are almost always there. You have a simulator and you're basically solving a planning problem. Uh, so you're not really doing this online learning thing. You're just solving a planning problem. So these, these examples that I have brought up were of that nature and the other examples where we had the biggest successes are, are also of that nature. Why is this important? Well, a simulator can run much, much faster than if you have to act in the real world. And if you have only some data set representing a system that you need to interact with in the future, then as Rich would say, all bets are off and uh, you already lost the game before you started playing. Um, so I'm, we're not going to go there. Like we are just going to play easy. So we want to solve the planning problem. You have a simulator, which is really fast. You also have large compute. Uh, in all of these examples, people use a lot, a lot of compute. They don't have infinite compute though, right? They need large compute. And they also use function approximation. We haven't, saw, we haven't talked about how uh, they use function approximation yet, or what is function approximation doing, but it's like, it's there. Uh, so the question is to ask like, are these sufficient and when, and like which algorithms and, and is this going to work? So first of all, function approximation. So the bird's eye view of functional approximation is that it's just doing abstraction or compression. I, I like to think about it as like this whole business of planning in the presence of functional approximation is just compressed computation, trying to do compressed computation. So you have an oversized MDP uh, with so many states, such a large horizon that you can't just do these enumerative calculations. You want to be clever about it. 
and you want to leverage some extra piece of knowledge that's given to you in terms of that someone's telling you that, hey, some objects in this MVP are compressible. That can be represented with a few number of parameters. So you only have to adjust these 1 million parameters in this neural network, not the 100 billion states that, uh, that exist out there in this, I don't know, game of Go or whatever example. All right, so um, this is uh, compressed computation and, uh, and the, the promise is that this is going to help. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's the potential upshot that uh, maybe these hints are useful and then we should be able to take advantage of them and somehow use it, uh, use them to our advantage. So what are we going to compress? Well, um, standardly people compressing value functions, either just optimal value functions or the optimal action value function, or they are compressing uh, the value functions of any of the policies that they encounter as, as they are doing their computations. Or they're compressing policies. So these are basically the options, or they're compressing the MDP. So I'm kind of leaving that out, but that's, that's also there. Uh, if you're really compressing the MVP, uh, that's, that's kind of a different word. So I'm not going to talk much about that. Ask me about it uh, later. Uh, at the end, maybe I come back to it. Uh, so, but today I, I really want to focus on the case when the compression is not at the level of the MVP, but it is somehow at the level of uh, value functions. Uh, and I'm not going to touch much uh, policies either. Uh, enough to be said that I don't think that policy compression has much promise uh, in uh, going beyond, much beyond uh, of what you would get if you are trying to compress value functions. So what I have seen so far successful always goes through value functions. So I have never seen a single example, either empirical or theoretical example, where one would come up with some promising result that would say, hey, we can compress these policies. Uh, and, and there are some lower bonds and hardness designs for policy, uh, like computation with compressed policy classes. Uh, those are not really hard to get by. Computational hardness really, really stands in the way. Um, all right, so uh, today I'm just going to focus on uh, linear function approximation. We all love uh, and know very well in our function approximation. Uh, it is the simplest uh, way of approaching uh, compressing functions, real valued functions over some domain. You have uh, some fixed number D basis functions and you are linearly combining them, thereby representing whatever functions you can. It's gonna be a D dimension, very dual dimension of subspace in a huge space. It's like a very, very small subspace in a huge space that you can represent. Uh, so that's what uh, linear function approximation can do. Um, so why, do, why, why would you believe that something can be compressed about these domains? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, so here I, I will use a, a silly example to uh, convince you that there could be a lot of things that you can compress. So, Take this visual Monte Carlo example. You have this car with this physics dynamics, and maybe you know the position and velocity of the car. It needs to go up on the hill. It's under parts, so it has to go back and forth. And that's the control problem you need to solve. Uh, but the observation space is ruined with additional observations like, oh, there are these flowers, they're blinking. They're completely unrelated to the task that you need to solve. And someone um, could have the hint that they are unrelated. And so they will tell you that the optimal value function is such that whatever state the flowers are in, the optimal value function is going to stay, take the same value. So that's compression, right? You compress the way, you, you abstract it away some part. And like in this example, it's obvious this is gonna work, it's fine. It's much less obvious how to do this well. Uh, if you have uh, an arbitrary robotics problem or whatnot, and why the chosen function approximation technique would work well, but okay, let, let me leave it like this, that uh, potentially this could work, 
right? So you can imagine that someone comes up with some basis function such that some compression happens. And then the job that remains is to design some algorithm that takes advantage of this, right? In a meaningful way. And that's, that's a very reasonably defined problem, I say. All right, so back to our framework. We want flexibility, effectiveness, and efficiency. How do we fill this out? Well, we have the task, get, get me a good policy, um, given some interaction with a simulator in a local planning way. And uh, what is going to be flexibility? Well, uh, the, uh, the algorithm should accept any MDP and any feature map. So no uh, exceptionalism there. Uh, it has to work in all, all of these cases. Uh, effectiveness, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but in a nutshell, it should be that uh, if you have a better fit between the MDP and the feature map, then you expect your algorithm to perform better. Maybe up to the proportion of fact, uh, proportion to the to the, the quality of this fit. Um, and efficiency is just going to be uh, body runtime and um, in, in terms of the, the relevant quantities, um, which is uh, the horizon um, uh, discounted problem that would be just one over one minus gamma, the number of actions, the dimension, and, and the target accuracy of, of the policy. That's, that's that, like the suboptimality level of the policy. And, and the number of states should make the no appearance. And hopefully, we're not going to see A to the power of H either, right? So it's, it should be part of the these quantities. Um, so in terms of effectiveness, uh, let me elaborate on that because that's where you can fork in zillion different ways. Um, and uh, so here we're talking about how well the policy induced is going to perform. So that's one metric that goes into the measure of effectiveness, whether your planner is effective or not, depends on whether the policy that is induced by running the planner is going to perform well or not. So the suboptimality level of the policy induced by the planner, that's your data. And then if you have that, the other quantity is this fitness between the MDPs and the features. So you can list all the MDPs, you can list all the feature maps, and some of them are going to be in a more harmonic relationship than some of these. So what do I mean by that? So that I can mean many, many different things. So one of the simple thing is that uh, you could just like ask for, how well uh, the features are uh, able to approximate or with the features, how well you can approximate the optimal action value function. So that's a measure of fit between the features and the MDPs. And if there is a better fit, then we expect the algorithms to deliver policies whose induced suboptimality gap is smaller. We want graded uh, performance response to the quality of the fit, uh, right? So we don't want any abrupt like drops of performance that like, ah, like a little bit, uh, the errors go up and then suddenly you lose everything. Uh, graded responses, that would be awesome. You can have a number of, like a large number of different metrics and then we are gonna implicitly talk about these different metrics uh, today in the rest of the talk. So any of the metric of, of this kind would be uh, how, well in, uh, how well you can approximate the action value functions of any policy. So that's like the worst case approximation error of the, approx uh, of the action value functions of the policies using the features. And another one would be like how well you can capture the dynamics of the MDP as described by the Bamon optimality operator, whatever that is. Uh, so that's that's another metric. So you can you can come up with the different metrics for each of the metrics. The study is kind of the same. You want to ask this question: Can I have this planner, which is poly time, um, per 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 state that it encounters? So that's that's the cost per state. So it's it's going to be much larger when you're running it like in a loop, right? Then it's like as many number of times that you're running it. Uh, but, but we only care about the, uh, the per state complexity. So is it poly time and it, can it keep up with the approximation error and can it deal with any uh, pair of uh, MDP, MDP feature map pair? So that's, that's, that's what we want. So 
uh, more firmly, the effectiveness is like the suboptimality of the policy in use should be not much larger than some function of the fit between the MDP and, and the, the feature map. And then the question is, okay, how small is this function? Let's say in the limit of uh, infinite computer for a given computational budget. So this is, uh, this kind of ends uh, discussing this. Well, efficiency, it's, it's, it's like where I already said it, like you do this local planning and then like you count how many queries you submitted uh, to the simulator or the total computation. Hopefully the two match. Sometimes we can only bound the number of queries uh, or we lower bound the number of queries and therefore we know that the computation is also going to be uh, large. All right, so efficiency means few queries and small compute. So uh, let's map out some uh, results. Oh, uh, maybe before that, like, do we have any, any questions for the framework? All clear, good. Everyone's excited to see some results. Um, all right, so we're gonna have like uh, the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, it's a cliche. Uh, so three cases. Um, and I will try to, to discuss and go through these three cases and then uh, show how they are similar or dissimilar to each other. The good case is kind of an idealized case and I'm going to start with that. This is going to be the order. And that's the case. Uh, when someone tells you that, hey, I designed these features and I promise that they're good to capture the action wave function of any of the policies up to some approximation error epsilon. So that's kind of like the, the meaning of this notation. And here the approximation error is measured, let's say in L infinite norm uh, to be specific F is this function space induced by the features. Okay, so that's, that's the first case. The second case, uh, so it's, it's a good case because it's like really strong features and you expect a lot, right? Like that should be good. And hopefully we'll get uh, strong results that say that, wow, we have this great poly time algorithms that can do everything. Um, the bad and the ugly, I, I will explain, explain that later. There are the more ambitious cases in a way uh, that you don't, you don't want, uh, to demand uh, this poor person who is designing the features to come up with feature maps that can compress uh, the action wave function of any policy because in a way that kind of restricts the, the MDPs that you can deal with, right? Like if you want to enlarge the scope of MDPs that you want to deal with, then you somehow want to uh, just compress fewer objects in the MDPs. And what those could be, well, they could be the action wave function or the, the wave function, and here I'm going to talk about when this is possible to do in an exact way for, for, the, for the very last one, we can, we can go back and then discuss what happens if uh, this compression is not, not exact. So let's see, uh, what, what are these results? So this is, this is the good part. Um, so the first question uh, to ask, it turns out uh, if you're in this situation, is uh, how big is the approximation error of the features and how suboptimal the policy that the planner should produce should be. If the suboptimality data of the planner should be much less than you have the features, query D times epsilon, then somehow like things don't work. Okay, so, so in this case, and, and this was a very inspiring paper uh, that kind of initiated a lot of uh, the other investigations, I guess, uh, in this. Um, so in this paper, uh, these authors, uh, Simon and, and uh, co-authors, they, they show that uh, if you're demanding this much, then don't expect that you will find an ergotum because you won't find an ergotum that runs in poly time. So you can cook up an example. Uh, it's based on the Johnson Linden show slam. It's kind of like a needle in a haystack thing. It's, it's an extrapolation error thing um, that, that tells you that uh, you have to submit at least exponential number of queries in the smallest of the dimension on the horizon 
to the simulator if you want to come up with a good policy. And, uh, and there is no way around this. So, so this is a, a negative result that says that high accuracy planning in the presence of approximation errors, which is not going to fly. Okay, uh, it's kind of like just, actually it's not that complicated because if you have these approximation errors and you're measuring this function at, at a fixed number of points and usually measuring it in noise, then you can expect that uh, your extrapolation errors are going to blow up. And how can they, blow, like, like what limits their blow up? They have the dimensionality of the features limits their blow up, but nothing else limits their blow up. And uh, since we are interested in approximating functions everywhere over at least the actions, like just, just think about when you have a large action space and you just want to choose a good action and, and you have queried a few of these actions, but you haven't queried too many actions, then you need to extrapolate to know how good the other actions are. And, and that means uniform error should be small. And to control the uniform error, you really need a lot of measurements if you want high accuracy compared to the approximation error. This is just the geometry of things, okay? So nothing much to do about this. Um, if, um, if you're not that demanding on the other hand, then it turns out that you can do things. Uh, so you can just uh, come up with uh, some good way of, uh, of choosing some basis uh, sort of in the feature space, this is G-Optima design. And Ben had also some other ways using other dimensions. Uh, to show that this is possible. And then you can have a polytime ergotum, which is fully polynomial in the relevant quantities uh, that solves this problem and actually solves the global planning problem. It's not only solves the local planning problem, it solves the global planning problem. And that's, that's, uh, that makes this, uh, it kind of salvages this case. It's not that bad. Like, okay, it's a little bit ugly, uh, I say. And the ugly part is actually that you somehow like have to come up with, uh, with the state action pairs. Uh, let's say you have uh, state action features that give you this uh, need optima design. That doesn't have to be exactly an optima design, G optima design for that matter, but like something like that. It has to be something close to that. And uh, if you only have to access to a simulator um, and, and you don't have infinite compute power uh, so that you can go through all the state action pairs. So like in this pre-processing step, like, so you can hide this thing, right? Like you could pre-process the whole feature map, come up with this G-Optima design, call it a day, but like that's not really uh, what, what is, what like that's, that's not still not tractable if you, if you, uh, if you count that pre-processing step. So if you want to do all this, uh, without this pre-processing, then the features are sort of streamed to you, right? Like if you go to a state, you see this feature associated with that and, and all the actions, and that's the only way to get to know the features, uh, then we still don't have an algorithm that would be able to do this. So that's, that's a nice open question that uh, is quite interesting. I think we're gonna have an algorithm soon about this, by the way, but... Uh, it's still in the works. I'm optimistic. Okay, let's 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 put it that way. That uh, we're gonna have a full solution to this, uh, hopefully, pretty soon. So this uh, I talked about this. This is extrapolation, interpolation, uh, and uh, so there is this other question of like, okay, I didn't show the details of like how suboptimal uh, the policy is going to be at the end. Okay, a square root of d blow up is is necessary. But it actually, there's a second blow up that happens, uh, which is related to the horizon, the planning horizon, this one over one minus gamma in discounted problems. And if you do all this planning uh, using approximate policy iteration or fitted policy iteration, as we were originally suggesting in this paper, uh, then this blow up factor is, is quadratic in the horizon. And if you care about this, okay, I guess like this is the, the leveling of the, it's a performance level where it, where it goes in the limit of unit computation. 
if it goes much below this and with the same speed, it would be much more acid, right? Um, so can we go below this? Uh, uh, actually, Dan tells us that you can't. Like he has an example, uh, an idealized example where he shows that approximate policy iteration is kind of prone to suffer a blow up uh, that is quadratic in this uh, horizon. Uh, blow up of the approximation error. So, so questions, can we do better? There's been a bunch of works. Well, long story short, you can. Uh, you have to change the algorithm. And so here, what's in, important is that somehow, like this comes up all the time. You have, like the policy iteration updates are too abrupt. And, and somehow if you slow down this, these updates, you do it in a principled way, then it turns out that, okay, maybe the convergence speed is going to be a little bit slower. It's still polynomial, it's still fine, um, but it's not as fast like geometric rates for policy iteration because there's a contraction. You give up on that and then you can lower this floor uh, just to be linear in the horizon. And interestingly, this algorithm is also related to gradient uh, methods. It's not quite a gradient method, but it's like really close to natural policy gradients. Uh, it's, it's almost doing the same updates. Anyway, so you can do this. Um, we're kind of getting there, I would say, for this good case. Uh, good case almost uh, closed. Uh, we don't have a matching lower bound, but I, I think we should have a uh, matching lower bound. Um, maybe we'll have it. Um, someone here might be doing it. Um, so the next case is, uh, well, it turns out this, this is a bad case. It should be a promising case. It should be a good case, but maybe it's a bad case. Uh, this is where uh, the only assumption we make about the features is that it captures the optimal action wave function. The, the beginning of the study is the same. So I, I will repeat that high accuracy planning is not feasible for the same reasons. Uh, but if you don't want high accuracy, uh, you have another fork, another question. Do we have a large number of actions? We already touched up on a little bit that if you have a large number of actions, these extrapolation errors can be quite mean. Uh, and it turns out that it is actually quite bad in this case. So uh, you want a few queries and figure out these D parameters that describe uh, more or less the optimal action value functions. Someone gave you this promise that D parameters in this huge MDP, which has a large number of actions, uh, describes exactly the optimal action value function. There are no approximation errors. And yet, you can't do it. So the previous result that uh, was about approximation errors, here there are no approximation errors. This is just about that you can, you can hide needles in a haystack if you have large action spaces, basically have to, to try all of them. Um, I will have a slide about how this construction works, but it's, it's basically a finite horizon setting all rewards are deterministic. It's a huge, huge tree because you, you can have as many states as you wish. And uh, except for the last layer uh, that there are band newly rewards with very small scale, which means that you basically see the same rewards all the time for MDPs uh, where the optimal actions are gonna differ. Um, no matter what you do, unless you try the critical optimal actions, which you don't have a chance to try because there are exponentially many actions. So that's, that's the construction. Um, and so uh, the extrapolation errors based on this example are provably compound in this, uh, in this planning problem. So that's, that's kind of the bad news that uh, you can't tame it. Uh, it's like, it's no matter how you spin it, <laughs> this is just not, not going to fly. Uh, so logic and spaces are, are really cruel. Um, together with large uh, state space. And this is this is the construction. So it's like you start at the top and then you go to the bottom and then the optimal action always quits on this exit lean. And uh, when it quits, it receives some reward, but like you have so many actions, like you never find these optimal actions. And all you see is zero rewards. And like you, you never discover any structure uh, in these MDPs. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, 
maybe some other time, or if you have questions about this, then I can explain the details. Uh, so if we don't have many actions, uh, then, then we don't know uh, what the answer is. Uh, we know partial answers like, if you have a positive gap and then you can, you load this pre-processing, you can come up with a tree optimal design, then, okay, you can have a, an algorithm, which is, which is nice, but uh, this gap assumption is maybe a little bit troublesome. So here, uh, the gap means that uh, it's the, the difference between the value of a state and uh, the value of a suboptimal action at the state and the, take the worst case over all possible states, it's pretty crazy and you're going to be inversely, uh, you're going to be polynomial with the inverse of this gap. Like you can imagine this gap is going to be tiny, 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 most of the problems. Um, so, but anyway, so that, that's a partial result at least, but in general, this question is open and I think it's quite interesting. Uh, I have not the faintest clue of where this is going to go. So, uh, the, the last one is um, when the optimal value function can be uh, represented by the features. And uh, this is gonna be interesting. So, so it's kind of starts the same. Uh, if you want high accuracy planning, large approximation error, it's all bad. If not, then if you have many actions, it's all bad. Just because uh, if you have uh, only state value functions, then you would need to do one step look at calculations, even if you had the value function in, uh, in your hand uh, to figure out which action is good. Um, so that's kind of like a bummer. Uh, so in the previous case, if you have action value functions, if you have an oracle that can solve for the optimal action, uh, given a, a Q function, given an action value function, uh, then you would be fine with poly queries, right? Like it's the query complexity is small, then somehow if you can manage the calculation of the argmax uh, with respect to the action value functions, then you would be fine. But here you need the simulator access. If you only have uh, the optimal uh, state value function. Anyway, so if you don't have many uh, actions, then you have to ask yourself, do I care about runtime or do I care about query cost? Uh, well, let's care about query cost. That's kind of easier to control. Um, it happens that if you only want to control query cost, uh, then we found an algorithm that, can, uh, that has a poly, uh, poly bound, uh, Poly query complexity for a fixed number of actions. So it's a small uh, number of actions. Let's say you have two actions, then this is D squared. Um, the algorithm is not advised to be used if you have a larger number of actions. Uh, and, and in general, uh, we don't know whether this uh, D, to the, D to the power of A that appears in our bond is necessary or not. Like that's, that's also a, an interesting open question. Uh, so I want to say just a few words about this ergotum because it's it's also interesting that this is also not a DP based ergotum. Uh, so this ergotum um, is uh, following the the optimism principle in a way. So someone promised you remember that the optimal wave function can be represented exactly with the features. The, the job is to find out what are the parameters. So you can keep around the set of possible parameters. So that's like this green set. And then given that set and given the initial state where you need to plan uh, for the action at, uh, you solve for the parameter vector that gives you the maximum value within this uh, feasible set. So that's optimistic planning. And once you have that, then uh, this parameter induces a policy. And so here there is some interesting uh, changes compared to what uh, people normally do. So when this policy induced, there is no max. Uh, so if you're at a state, we are looking just for local consistency, any action that satisfies uh, the equation that is shown in the bottom, uh, which is that the value at the current state and the current stage, so this is for finite horizon setting for 
uh, for, uh, for this case, uh, the, the predicted value at that state uh, but this parameter is equal to the immediate reward plus the expected future value at the next states uh, as predicted by the same parameter. If you find such an action, take it. Don't look for the max. Don't try to go for the max. This is, this is enough. And it actually makes the algorithm stronger. And the way it makes the algorithm stronger is that this way we can comp it with uh, like it, the algorithm can be applied to the case when there exists a parameter vector such that the value function underlying this parameter vector uh, is compatible with the features in the sense that like uh, this equation is satisfied here. Okay, so, and of, obviously if V star is represented with an optimal value function satisfies this. So this is a more general case. So we are solving a more general problem and, and the benefit of, of solving this um, is that, I don't know, like, do I have, uh, yeah, I, I have this slide, uh, which kind of shows the benefit of this. So the benefit of doing this is that we can do some algebra because checking whether there exists an action such that this equation holds for that action, it's an existential question. It's not a question of a max. And uh, so you can subtract the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you end up with a TD adder, and uh, the existence of an action such that the TD adder is zero for some of the actions, you can express that compactly by saying that, well, the product of these TD adders is equal to zero. So that's like the, the funky thing about the zeros, right? Like if any of these um, terms in a product is zero, the whole thing is zero. And if the whole thing is zero, then one of the, one of the terms must be zero, right? And the products we love because you can write this product as a tensor product. So we just lifted the problem into a higher dimensional space. It's a D to the power A dimensional space that we are working with, this tensor product. But other than that, it's a linear problem. So we kind of like can bring back our favored linear algebra tools and just say that, well, it was a D to the power of A dimensional problem. We don't have to query that much, right? So you just like collect enough information. You need to figure out the theta parameter such that for like, you know that uh, there exists a theta parameter such that for all state action pairs, these equations are satisfied. You don't have to query that much. You're gonna be optimistic and it's going to have uh, because uh, then um, that allows you to, to verify uh, the hypothesis that, uh, that you're doing well. And you're going to run rollouts, and then with the rollouts, you can verify whether your predictions are correct or not. And you can avoid the whole issue of DP that you're accumulating errors. You just go for the algebra. And, and it's it's kind of really neat. So that's that's how the algorithm works. Um, and that's how we can we can get this result. So it's gonna be uh, polynomial. We understand why it's d to the power of a now. Um, and we don't know what happens with the runtime of this, this algorithm though, right? So this optimistic planning, um, it's, it's not looking great. Uh, in general, uh, it's, it's hard to say much about that. This could be hard. Sometimes people can relax it a little bit and then still get out a polytime algorithm, but uh, that's done on a case by case basis and, and it's, it's, it's not trivial at all. So um, summary, time's up. So uh, I, I think that the key to uh, successful RL is that we want to have these algorithms that can do computation in compressed form. And I, I stole this uh, from uh, some uh, presentation uh, given by, uh, by folks talking about fluid dynamics and like how they can do really cool compressed calculations with fluid dynamics, so that, that's why we have uh, this figure here. So we're kind of trying to do in a way uh, the same with our, our tools and techniques and function approximation. And uh, given the uniqueness of the situation that we are in, it's, it's different, but it's kind of the same. Um, so what are the lessons? Uh, well, 
at this stage, it's like, I really don't see the big picture yet of like, where, where do we go with all these different cases? And I, I only listed a few of these and then there are a growing number of these different sub cases and uh, we can decide about tractability, intractability. Uh, so the one big conclusion so far to me is that the nuances uh, really do matter a lot. So just think about you move from Q star to V star or back and uh, all of these things, uh, these nuances do, do matter a lot. Um, um, so, so one of the first things that matters a lot is uh, what is being compressed, right? So we haven't talked about compressing the moda, but if you have somehow uh, very nicely compactly represented MDP, uh, linear MDP has come to mind, that's a lucky situation. Then, then you can do everything, then, then you're golden. Um, uh, in, in the other cases, um, whether you're compressing all the functions, then still the extrapolation errors are there and they can compound and uh, are you doing uh, V star or Q star approximation? Uh, there is this recent paper that does both and then it finds that uh, at least when you're interacting with a simulator like we did here, uh, then the V star Q star, uh, if, if you can approximate both of them linearly, then that leads to a poly time algorithm, not just poly query complexity. So that's the beats tensor plan in that, uh, in that way with this additional assumption. Uh, in general, global planning seems to be hard, uh, yet it feels that a lot of people are kind of still trying to do that. So, that's a big contrast to what I've been talking about today and what happens in practice. Because uh, uh, you run these big neural networks and they're all global. Like they're not replanning that much. Eh, sometimes the MCTS, when, when it comes in, then that's, that's local planning. So that, that's good. But a lot of times you see that that's not happening. And uh, maybe one lesson is that local planning can be so much more powerful. So if you can afford, the cycles, the compute cycles, why not like throw in some local planning? It can help. Uh, maybe we should do it more often than, uh, than what we're doing now. Uh, if there is a gap in this values or not, uh, I really don't know. Uh, it does matter. I don't know how to think about it. Like I need to think more about that. Like, or whether we can change that condition in some way to, to make it more likely to happen or uh, or not, and but there are many actions we saw that like that's a recurring team. Uh, I think that if you have many actions, you have you ought to have other structures, as well, because I don't otherwise just the maximization over the action component is going to be hard and like somehow, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to think about that. The criterion does matter. Like I didn't talk about it, but you have some very easy hardness results for infinite horizon undiscounted problems. You can have a hypercube essentially and uh, the shortest pro pass problem on the hypercube, you have to go to, uh, to one of the corners and you can linearly represent that, but you're not getting any information with any of the local moves because everything in the hypercube looks the same. So uh, because of that, obviously, it's going to take exponential time to discover where the corner that you have to go to is. Uh, so if you're not doing this counting, uh, then I don't know. Uh, it seems really, really hard, um, very easily. Uh, sometimes deterministic environments do have. So Cheng and Ben uh, had this result early on that uh, if you are doing online learning with uh, deterministic uh, MDPs, uh, Q star approximation does work with optimism, uh, which is, uh, yeah, like, should we, should we think more about the deterministic MDPs? Is that, is that such a hard book is? Uh, maybe not. I don't know, since you're already doing function approximation, it's maybe not. Uh, uh, such a such a big thing to uh, to bring in determinism, uh, especially since it makes uh, perhaps such a big difference. That's suspicious, by the way. Uh, 
maybe you should have more gradual changes, right? So a little bit stochastic shouldn't throw you off, but uh, in the counter example that we have in the lower bound, we have just stochastic rewards, a very small scale, two to the minus h for uh, h step problems. And it's like, okay, it's like a Kurtz's problem, right? Like somehow the problem is not smooth in that way. Um, anyways, um, which argotum? Uh, I guess like everyone wants to know like, oh, okay, like do we have new argotums here? Yes, we do have some new argotums. Uh, are they really uh, ready for uh, mainstream employment? Well, uh, some of these are pretty close, right? So this polytech, it's like very close related to a lot of algorithms that people use in practice, people and whatnot. Um, others are maybe not so much, but uh, maybe there are some lessons to be learned about uh, like how to, like which algorithms to use. It seems DPs are dominated. Like it's, it's a recurring theme that DPs are not winning this game of efficient large scale planning. Uh, you have to really, kind of nail the conditions that are required for DPs, for DPs to be the best. It is possible, like linear MDP is, is such a case, right? So, but uh, it's like, if you try to kind of broaden the scope, then DPs are losing. Uh, and maybe we should do more, uh, more local planning. Anyway, so, so there is a lot of other things I could go on, but I should rather stop here.